there, AP HUD team. This is Sanchez back again with another exciting video lecture, uh, our flip lecture series, and we're focusing on Unit 2, which is development. And this lecture will correspond with our last uh, key issue in Chapter 9, which is the question of uh, why do LDCs face obstacles to development? All right, first things first, before we dive into the flip lecture for today, I want to introduce you to yet another method that could be uh, successful for a uh, note-taking strategy. This method is a modified version of what is known as an SQ3R. And in this case, we're actually going to shrink it down and we're going to boil it down to a, a survey question review. So you can see the survey portion, if you're using your text textbook, you should survey all the main headings, um, major uh, maps you see in the key issue outline, in this case, you should survey what you see in the video lecture, the major headings, the major maps that I'm including. Um, questions. After uh, listening to the video lecture, pause, perhaps maybe after each slide, and then you want to go ahead and write down two questions. Now, remember, you want to make sure that you're writing quality questions. These are supposed to be creating kind of like your own study guide. So don't try to write down simple definitions or uh, recall like what is an MDC but yet maybe challenge yourself. On the back of your Unit 1 or Unit 2 cover sheet, there's a series of guiding questions, um, unit questions that correspond to what College Board wants you to know for the test in May. So I suggest you take a look at that. That maybe also could help you design your questions. Finally, the last piece would be the review piece, and this is the part that I really want to push for some of you. If you're still finding your groove in terms of how to study or how to take notes, Besides just necessarily copying down information, you want to necessarily budget some time to go back and review. Now, review, this is typically where you can introduce a highlighter if you're going to highlight key points or major golden lines in their key issues. You also might want to suggest using a different pen color. So if you're writing most of your notes in blue or black pen, maybe pick up a red pen or a green pen or purple that would indicate some sort of color change where you could annotate or go back through your lecture notes. So try it for today, see if you guys can uh, utilize this method, and see again as we're introducing a new method each time, what works for your best uh, review process. All right, the focus for today we're gonna to take a look at is development strategies. So if we're addressing the issue of development around the world, and remember, we're going back to our definition, development is the improvement of the material condition through the process of diffusion of knowledge and technology, um, looking at economic geography, we want to highlight some development strategies. Now for this particular unit, there is kind of two aspects of economic geography. Um, the first part, which is our development unit, which we're highlighting in chapter nine. Uh, but there's a second section that's going to correspond with chapter um, 12, which is going to focus primarily on the industrial revolution. So I want to go ahead and start off with just kind of a brief overview in terms of some key assumptions of economic geography. Geography of supply versus the geography of demand. Now geography of supply, um, again, you don't need to be an economic uh, guru, but I want to remind you that uh, the supply is that there's costs of doing business vary and are different from place to place. And that can include around the world, we see that there's difference uh, access to raw materials. There can also be a different level or different ability of the labor force in terms of their skills or education and training. And we can also connect that to um, capital or even transportation. The second piece I just want to briefly introduce is geography of demand. Um, so kind of our general assumptions or go-to that we know that markets uh, vary spatially. Uh, so that will be different, different markets in different parts of the world, that would be determined on where the location of the consumers, the people actually buying or doing the demanding from the products. Um, wealth, which goes back to our purchasing power, how wealthy an, a country or a society is will indicate what's in demand or what type of products or services that they will want to acquire. And then also, of course, demand goes back to just general tastes. Around the world globally, we're going to see people want different things based on their culture, based on personal preferences, norms. So someone that uh, is living on the other side of the world can maybe necessarily demand or want a product that maybe the United States doesn't necessarily want or offer or even consider. 
So these are kind of the basic ground rules, not even in economic geography, but just economics in general, is the discussion of supply and demand. Now, in addition to supply and demand, I also want to take a moment to review the different sectors of economic activity. This one was featured in key issue number one, um, but when we did take the quiz in class, I did notice a lot of people missed some questions on this. Um, so make sure, folks, if you haven't gone back to address key issue number one in your um, chapter nine reading guide, there's a little graphic organizer. This might be a good place to kind of pull that out and have that next during this portion, portion of the lecture. So we can see the different levels of economic activity. We have what is called the primary economic activities, and those are usually involved with the harvest or extraction, taking of raw materials from the earth. So when you think of primary activities, you're looking at things like fishing, okay, taking fish from the ocean, natural resources. You're looking at agriculture, so I have a picture right here, farming and such, ranching, mining. These are all examples of primary economic activities. At the second tier, we have the secondary level, and the secondary economic activities are generally associated with the assembly or the putting together of raw materials into goods for consumption. So people will actually buy them or use them in some way. Um, so the secondary activities would include heavy industries, manufacturing, textile products. These are all examples of secondary activities. All right, also our sectors of economic activity we have is called, um, what we have is called tertiary. And tertiary involved the exchange of goods produced in secondary activities. So some examples of tertiary type activities would be retail, um, if we're talking about customer service, talking about restaurants, talking about hospitality, have a picture of a hotel uh, in this slide, and any other basic service jobs that occur in the tertiary sector of an economy. Now, you can see on the right-hand side, we have the, the sort of two higher tiers, where the quaternary sector, and this includes more that research development. This includes more um, education. This incl includes that um, different jobs, markets, that other endeavors having to do with generating or exchanging knowledge. And at the very, very top of our economic activity, we have what's called the quinary sector. And these are generally considered um, kind of a subset, it's kind of included of the quaternary activities. But those are actually involved the high level decision making. They're the ones that are running the corporations and management and planning and government and also scientific research. All right, so another little graphic to take a look at. So you can see right here kind of color coded of our different um, areas of economic activity. So it's important for talking about levels of development and strategies to how to develop a, a country. We have to understand how their economy is made up as far as different jobs and different levels. So most of our LDCs are going to fall in sort of that um, primary. Um, and the higher we go, more at the MDC level, we're looking more in that to that quaternary or even quine, quinary sector of the market. All right, another comparison on the screen right here, we can see we have a pie graph. And the colors indicate um, the tertiary would be kind of that orangey color, secondary yellow, and then the primary would be the green. So you can see, for example, in the United States, which is featured on the far left, uh, we have a relatively small portion that is devoted in the primary sector, um, our agriculture and kind of that raw extractions of resources. Most of our economy now nowadays is beefing up into more the tertiary sector, with hopes, of course, we're getting to the quinary or quaternary sector of the economic activity. But you can see in the middle, Brazil. Uh, we do see is kind of uh, more than 50% is still prime, almost 50% is primary, secondary. And on the far right, you can see, for example, Nepal, which has a majority over 80% of its economic activity still in that primary factor. So this can be a good indication in terms of how developed, whether it's an LDC or a developing country or a developed, more developed nation uh, to look at their activity. All right, one more graph to take a look at. So yet again, and, and hitting this pretty hard, folks, because this is pretty important in terms of how we continue our discussion looking at development and when we start moving into agriculture, when we start moving into industrial revolution. So here's another way to kind of uh, approach it. Maybe even consider drawing this in your um, notes as the kind of graphic organizer. So primary, we have more the LDC or the newly industrialized countries. A secondary, more of the newly industrialized or developing type countries. So tertiaries, we're getting up more into uh, developing or more developed. 
and up here the highest level of decision making would be more in the MDC category. Um, notice again, uh, transportation and communication is going to be uh, important in terms of how we approach uh, spreading and the diffusion of um, these uh, different development models. And it also says a global economy, international spatial division of labor. Um, so we can see that spatial division of labor more with the connectivity across the world today seems to be lessening um, according to this graphic. All right, I just mentioned um, transportation and connectivity. Um, huge if we're talking about um, the discussion of globalization, of course, but also really essential when we're talking about economic geography. So in this case, you can see all those lines across the world. And the title of this map is um, Supply Change are, be are Becoming More Dispersed and More Complex. Now, this is at a global scale, and you can definitely see right here indicated by this key in terms of the supply, the markets, the trade, the supply, the demand. Um, so we can see more and more the world is more connected. And that's also going to affect how we see economies develop. All right, the last piece I want to introduce in front load, and you can see on the screen, just to begin the discussion of what is known as an industrial economy, we are going to bring or come back to um, the industrial revolution. We get to um, industrialization piece later in the year. Uh, but just to make sure everybody's on the same page, uh, we have what is called the industrial revolution which is going to be taking place in England and is going to diffuse across the world. So when we talk about an industrial economy, our kind of our timeline is late 19th through mid 20th century. And with the industrial economy full in place, we have large domestic corporations or businesses, and we have a strong manufacturing base. Now, as things have been evolving over the course of time, what some geographers and economists are referring to as the post-industrial, post means after, this is more in the 20th and 21st century, and this is where we see the introduction of these huge transnational corporations, more IT, and again, more of that tertiary and quaternary sector of the economic activity. All right, with all that being said, just kind of setting the groundwork and making sure we're speaking on the same page, the core of today's lecture is going to focus on our development ideas and strategies. And I tried to categorize them in kind of four main um, buckets or areas. In key issue number two, it focused primarily on uh, the self-sufficiency approach, and it also introduces uh, Rostow's modernization model. So those are, those are key, and even in your reading guide, it gave you graphic organizers to understand uh, how those approaches are different, and what are the successes, and um, what are the failures of both those models. But this video lecture, I want to kind of extend it further. I'm going to start off looking at the modernization uh, model, which is roughly introduced in America in the 1950s. Um, I'm also going to introduce something known as the dependency theory or the core periphery model and how that relates to that. Neoliberalism, uh, but briefly mention. And of course, I'm also going to introduce the fact one of the ideas which we're connecting to right now with our um, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals uh, research project is this concept of trying to sustain and trying to have development last, not just for today, but for future generations to come. Modernization. Modernization is a series of stages a country like China goes through to industrialize and mature through the DTM. In 1950, W. W. Rostow proposed a five-stage model of development that further explained modernization, known as Rostow's Stages of Growth. The first stage of Rostow's model is named the Traditional Society. In a traditional society, there is a lack of development, meaning a high percentage of people in agriculture and a high percentage of national wealth only focused on what Rostow calls non-productive activities, such as military and religion. People in traditional societies build their lives around families, local communities, and religious beliefs. Their lives are often very similar to those of their ancestors. Side note, think of Mulan. They generally have very limited wealth, with most people as subsistence farmers. Little trade happens, but if any, bartering of other items is used as the form of payment. The second stage in the model is called the preconditions for takeoff. Leaders and other elite groups, like kings, motivate the population to start and innovate economic activities by building banks and currency. The population is influenced to start selling goods not for not just their own consumption, but for sale. 